there was a church that had been infested with squirrels. And they don't know how they were getting in, uh, maybe through the roof somewhere, but uh, the squirrels that got in there, they had multiplied. There was a real problem. And so the preacher of this church, he's getting together and he's having coffee with a weekly group of, of other preachers in town. And he's sharing about the problem. And they're giving him ideas about what he can do. And one of the preachers says, well, why don't you try this? said, uh, put up a squirrel feeder uh, outside the church and they'll go out there and get the food. And maybe they'll decide since that's the food source, they'd rather stay near that and they'll leave your building. Well, he came back the next week and he said, well, how did that work? He said, well, they, they, they came outside and ate all the food up, then went right back in to get warm inside. So it didn't help us out. So another one of the preachers said, why don't you try this? They've got these humane traps. I know you don't want to kill them. He said, but uh, just get the, one of these humane traps. He told them all about it and said, you can then take them out into the country and release them. So he came back the next week, said, how'd that work? He said, we tried it. He said, the squirrels were too smart for the traps. He said, but however, a couple of our toddlers in the nursery got out of the nursery and got into it. And they got trapped in there. Said, so that's not a good option working going forward. And so uh, he just said, I'll just have to figure this out. So he did some thinking about it. He came back the next week. And um, they said, well, how's the squirrel problem? He said, it's solved. And they said, really? He said, what'd you do? He said, I just did some thinking. And, and he said, it just came to me. He said, I baptized those squirrels, made them all members of the church, and now we only see them at Christmas and Easter. He said, <laughs> we can handle that. So how many, on a, that's actually tied in with what we're going to talk about today, believe it or not. How many of you all know someone who used to be very active in the church Maybe they were even that person that was here whenever the doors were open or in the church you're thinking of whenever the doors were open, but today they're not, they're not in the church anymore. Or maybe you know somebody that um, made a profession of faith, they were baptized, they were really on fire, um, but then today they're living a life that looks very different and uh, there's not a lot of evidence that they are... Uh, still interested in living a Christian life. Uh, we'd like to act like that never happens, but that wouldn't be true, would it? Today, I want to talk about that, and we're actually going to look at an instance uh, in, that's recorded in, in John chapter 6, where Jesus finds that many who are in the crowds that followed him suddenly leave, and they go their own way. And we're going to look at perhaps why they left, but also why this phenomenon happens Today, when people just either get mad and leave or they, maybe they drift away from the church, what happens? And so we can learn from that today. If you have your Bible, and I hope you do, turn to John chapter 6. We're going to start there with verse 60. John chapter 6, verse 60. In verse 60, it says, Many of his disciples said, This is very hard to understand. How can anyone accept it? Now, Jesus had just been teaching and uh, he was reading the room. He could tell some of the things he said didn't sit well uh, with the people. And they were kind of telling him, we're having a hard time understanding this, Jesus. We're having a hard time accepting what you just said. I think sometimes we can have what's called a paradigm shift. Maybe you're familiar with that term for those who, who aren't. A paradigm shift is when something happens that completely changes the way you look at something. For example, the internet was a paradigm shift. How many of you all remember the days before we had internet, just by show of hands? We did research papers. We went, young people, we went to this thing that was in a place called a library, and they had this brown thing that looked like a bookcase or something, but you went over to it and you pulled out these little drawers. Y'all know what I'm talking about? The card catalog. And you thumbed through all these little cards until you found the book you were looking for. And it had a whole bunch of numbers. And then you had to know the Dewey Decimal System and go find the book off the shelf that had to do. And if you needed information from that book, you could go and make copies. But they were like a nickel apiece for the copies. Uh, or how many of you all had a set of encyclopedias in your home when you were growing up? And if you needed to know anything, you look up on the Encyclopedia Brit Britannica or whatever your brand might have been. And we actually had encyclopedia salesmen 
that came by our homes. But when the internet came along, that was a paradigm shifter. And to do those old things seems crazy uh, to us today. I think part of the problem may be that when Jesus came, the stuff that he was laying down was a paradigm shift for them. And they had a hard time grasping some of the things he was talking about. Here's one of the big ones I think shifted. These people were used to, when they thought of a relationship with God, the law was drilled into their brains. Being in good standing with God means you keep the rules. You keep the, all the stuff on the checklist, and when you mess up, you go to the temple. There is a sacrifice for that. There is a ritual for that. you got to make it right, and then you get right back to the good rule-keeping. And the Pharisees piled more rules on top of the ones that were in the law. And so they were all about keeping rules. And Jesus comes along, and he's talking about the spirit of the law. And he says, I'm not just coming to, to drill more laws into you, but I'm here to tell you about the intent behind it, about the heart of the Father and the whole spirit behind everything that you've been doing now for centuries. And they had a hard time making this paradigm shift. But I think it wasn't just what they didn't understand that Jesus taught. I think they had problems with what they did understand. Mark Twain is quoted as saying this. He said, it ain't those parts of the Bible that I can't understand that bother me. It's the parts that I do understand. And I think maybe a lot of us can relate to that. It wasn't just a matter of their understanding. It was a matter of their acceptance. Now, maybe you've heard something. You go, I understand. I understand what you said perfectly well. I'm just not sure I like it. Right? And sometimes you'll come to church and you'll be like, oh, I understood you, Greg. Not really liking what I heard you say. And sometimes we get stuck there. Jesus taught some things that made people feel good. When he talked to him about the love of the Father. And he goes, look, I know his heart. He loves you. He's for you. He's not against you. He talked about grace and mercy and forgiveness and things that make us feel warm and fuzzy. But sometimes Jesus also came and he called them out for their hypocrisy. And he said, I know the sin in your life. And I know, like we looked at last week with the woman at the well, he said, you don't have a husband. You've had five husbands, and the man you're with now is not your husband. And he said, I know all of that about you. And, and, and even the, the woman who was caught in the act of adultery, and they were going to stone her, he, he rescued her from her accusers. But then what did he say? You need to go and sin no more. You need to turn around. And so sometimes Jesus gave them hard truths they needed to hear. But Jesus on this day could read the room. He could tell that many of his listeners were taking offense to the, some of the things he had just said. And so in verse 61, it says, Jesus was aware that his disciples, and here we're not just talking about the 12, we mean all the disciples, mean the, the people that were following him from town to town, the disciples as, in a, as a group. It says he was aware that his disciples were complaining, so he said to them, does this offend you? He asked an honest question. Are you offended by what I just said? Now, he didn't apologize for what he just said because it was truth. His main goal, though, was not to please the audience. His main goal was to deliver truth as lovingly as he could, but as plainly as he could. If anything, when the people were offended, he doubled down. He made sure they were aware of exactly what he said and exactly what he meant. You know, there comes a time in the life of church Throughout the Bible, there, there came times when you just need to draw the line of truth so you can figure out which side people are standing on. These are defining moments. In the Old Testament, we read about one of those times. It happened in the history of the children of Israel. Now, if you've read much of the Old Testament, it tells you about the Israelites. When they left Egypt, came in the, through the wilderness for 40 years, they wandered in the wilderness. It didn't take that long to get to the promised land. It took them that long because they kept waffling between obedience to God and idolatry. They do okay for a while, but along the way, they would take on too much of the culture and the practices of the people around them, and they started worshiping idols again. And they would drift off course, and God would discipline them. It took them 40 years before they finally got back to the promised land. But I think Joshua just got, he's the one that took over for Moses after Moses died. I think Joshua just finally got fed up and he drew a line. And he said, look, you all need to make a decision. If you're going to be idolaters or if you're going to be God people. But you can't be both. And in Joshua 24, he says, but if you refuse to serve the Lord, then choose today whom you'll serve. 
Would you prefer the gods of your ancestors who served beyond the Euphrates? Or will it be the gods of the Amorites in whose land you now live? Then he says this, and we, many of us know this part. But as for me and my family, we're going to serve the Lord. And so he drew a line in the sand, and he stood over here and says, we're, we're, we're God followers over here. You can have your idolatry over there. That's not the direction I'm leading. So if you're going to need to find another leader if that's the way you're going. Who's with me and just who's not, get over there so we all know where we stand. And I just imagine there were a lot of people on the other side. Said, Joshua, we're, we're just not sure. But Joshua was okay with that because at least he knew where he stood and where they stood. We read in Scripture of a time when Jesus drew a line just to make sure the large crowd of people, uh, that in that crowd he knew who the fans were that were just following him but who the real followers were that wanted to be disciples. We read about that in Luke chapter 14 when it says a large crowd was following Jesus and he turned around and he said to them, if you want to be my disciple, you must, by comparison, hate everyone else, your father and your mother, your wife, your children, your brothers and your sisters, even your own life. Now, Jesus was not saying you got to hate everybody. Jesus was all about love. But he said, when you think of how much you need to love me, by comparison, there's this huge gap that makes the love you feel for these important people in your life seem like hate. You need to love me so much more if you really want to be my disciple. And then he goes on. He says, "Um, otherwise you cannot be my disciple. And if you do not carry your own cross and follow me, you can't be my disciple. Jesus said, it's nice when I'm passing out fishes and loaves and and you see the miracles and we all want to be in the crowd then. But I'm just telling you, if you continue on this path with me, there's going to be some tough stuff. It might cost you your livelihood. It might cost you a a trip in, in jail. Some of you in this crowd, he might have said, are going to be flogged for your faith. Are you going to be a disciple then? Just so you know, who's all with me on this side of the line? And some of the people thin themselves out. They left. The Bible says that in the last days there will be many who shun some of God's truths and they seek teachers, they seek churches who will water it down and only tell them the warm and fuzzy parts that they want to hear. In 2 Timothy chapter 4 it says, for a time is coming when people will no longer listen to sound and wholesome teaching but they'll follow their own desires and will look for teachers who will tell them whatever their itching ears want to hear. They will reject the truth, and they will chase after myths. How many of you all know that this book is coming under fire today? Not just outside the church, within the so-called church. This book is being questioned. There are people trying to revise and reinterpret the things, saying, well, that doesn't apply, or that's not the case anymore. Listen, if something you read in the Bible doesn't line up with your opinion or your preference, some today will choose, I'll just go and find a, a church that teaches it the way I believe it. Preachers who are more worried about the size of the crowd than they are in making disciples will be silent on certain topics because that's controversial. So let's don't preach on that. Let's don't say anything about it because somebody might get offended and leave. There are churches that reinterpret doctrine to fit the times rather than letting the, the, the word say what it says and line up their doctrine with that. There's a big difference. Paul told Timothy, he said, when, when, when the culture gets tough, he said, stand with the truth. It may cost you, Timothy. It may cost you personally. It may cost you some people in the crowd, but stand with the truth and you can't go wrong. In 2 Timothy 4, 2, he said, preach the word of God. Be prepared whether the time is favorable or not. Patiently correct, rebuke, and encourage your people with good teaching. Stay in the book, Timothy. Let it say what it says and let the chips fall where they may. Please know, I never get up and come here on a Sunday morning looking to offend somebody. You might feel that way, but I don't get up and go, boy, who can I tick off today, you know? I'm really going to zing somebody today. I realize, and I want you to realize, I actually have the opposite personality. I am a people pleaser. I want everybody to feel good about me and to like me. Don't we all? I mean, does anybody get up and go, I just want everybody to hate me today, you know? We all, at the end of the day, just say, I just want to. And let me tell you, the older I get, the less I want drama. I'm like, you just do you, I'll do me, and we'll just leave each other alone, and we'll all be happy, you know? But in ministry, sometimes you don't have that luxury. 
Because sometimes the truth says this and the world says just go along to get along. And I'm like, I can't do that. I've got an obligation to the truth. And I know it's going to bring drama. And I know, but I, I've got to stand on the whole word of God. And so after asking them if they were offended by what he had said, he goes on in verse 62. He says, then what will you think? If you're offended by this, Jesus says, what will you think if you see the Son of Man ascend to heaven again? Now, at first I read that, I was like, what's he saying here? But I, I thought about the ascension. He's talking about the Son of Man ascending into heaven. Well, if you read about that in the book of Acts, it says the disciples were all gathered there, and Jesus whoo, ascends up into heaven. Imagine that if you were there. I mean, sometimes we just read this stuff, and we miss what that must have been like. Whoo, he goes up into heaven into a cloud, and they're all just standing there like a dog looking at a ceiling fan, just wondering what just happened, you know. And it says that this, this angel says, why are you looking up into the heavens? And he says, this same Jesus that you just now watched ascend in the clouds, he is going to do what? He's coming back in the same glory that you just watched him go into heaven. He is going to come back. And so I think Jesus is saying to him right here, if you're offended by a little earthly preacher who stands and tells you what this book says, listen, you would rather be offended here and now and get over it and repent of it and get right with it versus waiting until that day when he comes again and you stand before him and you try to give him a piece of your mind. That's not going to be a good option. Jesus said, I'd rather you get offended now in this age of grace so you can get in line with the truth. It's better to be confronted with it now and repent of it than to be faced with it in the judgment. The same truth. The same truth that makes us squirm now is the same truth we'll be judged by on the day of judgment. And I know I don't want anybody to stand in front of the judgment throne and ever look over at me and say, Greg, why didn't you tell me? Why didn't you tell me? And so if I have to uh, offend somebody with this, then I'll do it because I don't want that responsibility. Listen, you don't want that responsibility. Sometimes we tell our children things that may be hard for them to hear, but they need to hear it. Parents, you don't want them to look at you one day and say, why didn't you tell me? Why didn't you make me uncomfortable when I needed to be uncomfortable down here because now I'm really uncomfortable for all eternity? You don't want your coworkers to say, we talked about everything under the sun, but you never talked about the hard things with me. Why didn't we have that conversation? I would rather the people I know and love be uncomfortable down here with the truth of God so they can wrestle with it and repent of it and line up with it. Amen? So that we can stand with confidence before the judgment throne. You know, if you're upset over something that I say, I encourage you, first ask yourself, is this Greg's opinion? Or is he just sharing what Scripture says? Verse 63 says, The Spirit alone gives eternal life. Human effort accomplishes nothing. I can stand up here and give you my opinions. I got all kinds. They're not going to do you any good. And, but the very words I have spoken to you, Jesus said, are spirit and life. Jesus' words are in this book. My opinions won't get you anywhere. But if I'm telling you what's in this book, that has authority. I don't have authority. This book has authority. You can read this book on your own and let it have authority over your lives. Our opinions don't have authority. The scriptures do. If what I said made you mad and it's based upon scripture, you don't have a problem with me. You have a problem with the word. And if I offend someone with my opinion, that's on me. And sometimes I may do that without realizing I've done it. But I, if I offend you by telling you what God's word says, that, that falls on us. Verse 64, but some of you, Jesus said, you don't believe me. For Jesus knew from the beginning which ones didn't believe, and he knew who would betray him. Let's, let's talk about Judas for just a minute. Judas was in that crowd. Jesus wasn't surprised by Judas's betrayal. He didn't go, I didn't see that coming. Now what am I going to do? One of my 12 has turned on me. In fact, it had been prophesied centuries before in the Old Testament. Yeah, if you look in the book of Zechariah, chapter 11, verses 12 and 13, the prophets wrote about when the Messiah would come, he would be betrayed, even named that he would be betrayed for 30 pieces of silver, the exact amount that Judas sold him out for. Jesus knew this. That night at the Last Supper, they sat down and Jesus said, one of you all is going to betray me. 
He called it out. And they started looking at each other. And finally they identified it was Judas. Judas got up and he, he left. They, they, they knew what was up. Jesus wasn't surprised. Likewise, today, when people leave the church, when people leave the, the faith and just walk away, it doesn't surprise God either. In 1 John chapter 2, verse 19, it says, These people left our churches, but they never really belonged with us. Otherwise, they would have stayed with us. When they left, it proved that they didn't belong with us. Now, from the beginning of his ministry, Jesus knew as the crowds built, he knew not everybody in this crowd even believes I'm the Messiah. But they keep coming. Why did they keep coming? Some of them came because they, they needed a miracle. They were sick, they, they were lame, they were deaf, they had various problems, and they heard that this guy had done things for them, whether they believed he was a magic man or whatever they believed, they were in the crowd, but they didn't really believe he was the Messiah. They were just hoping he could do something for them. Do you think that's ever the case today? Uh, I got a problem in my life. I'm going to go to church. Hopefully, something will take and it can fix it. But we don't really deal with Jesus. We just want a fix for our problems. Maybe some stuck around because they enjoyed the show, and this was the best show in town. Remember, they didn't have TV back then, no Netflix, none of that. But there's this guy doing wild stuff downtown. Let's go down there and check it out and see what's happening. We heard it was a good show yesterday. Some maybe were in the crowd for that. But at some point, Jesus said, if you don't come to grips with the fact that I am the Messiah, I am the promised one, the only hope for mankind. At some point, your religion, your I'm kind of interested but not all in yet, that stuff will not stand up. It will drift and you'll drift and fade away. Likewise, I know not everyone in this crowd on a Sunday morning is yet at the point where you've truly made Jesus the Lord of your life. That doesn't make me happy to say that, but just in any crowd like this, Perhaps some of you are here just to keep your spouse off your case. You're like, she has nagged me so much that I just came to shut her up, Greg. You know, I'm here. She said we'd go out and eat somewhere after church. So that's what I'm in it for, if I'm honest with you. Maybe some of you are, are here and you're interested in Jesus, but you still don't want him messing with your life too much because you've got some of your old life. You kind of like that too. And so if you're really painfully honest this morning, You'd have to say, I got one foot in the world still, but I'm interested in this Jesus guy, but I'm just kind of seeing how this plays out right now. Maybe that's where somebody is today. Maybe you're a fan on Sunday mornings, but you're not really fully committed to be a follower Monday through Saturday. And you know what? That's, if that's where you are right now, that's okay. I'm glad you're here because there's a great chance you might take a next step. There's a part of your sinful life you're not ready to let go of yet. I think that's, that's the way it was with Judas. He was in the crowd. Judas was right there. He heard the same messages that Peter, James, John, and the other disciples heard. He heard the sermons. He saw the miracles. He spent time in the presence of the Messiah. But I'm not sure he ever truly believed that he was the Messiah. He never truly put his life in Jesus' hands. And at some point, he didn't last. He drifted away. Some people desert Jesus because he was never truly their Lord. Matthew 7, Jesus is talking about such folks. And listen, I think this passage I'm about to read you, Jesus is talking not about the people that are out there that we know are lost. I think he's talking about the church. Listen, he says, not everyone who calls out to me, Lord, Lord. That's talking about people who did the religious thing for a while. Not everybody who calls out to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Only those who actually do the will of my Father in heaven will enter. On judgment day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, we prophesied in your name. We cast out demons in your name. We performed many miracles in your name. But I will reply, I never knew you. Get away from me, you who break God's laws. Now, notice Jesus didn't say, I stopped knowing you. I used to know you, but I don't know you anymore. That's not what he said. He said, I never knew you. You were kind of hanging around the crowd like, like Judas was, but you never really went all in on this Messiah thing. You never really embraced me as your Savior and Lord. There's a percentage of people in most Sunday morning crowds who, if you're honest, you're a fan of Jesus, but you're not yet, and notice I said yet, a follower of Jesus. Big difference. And this is why I'm always pushing you, and I'm not going to stop pushing you, to take a next step and a next step. 
This is why I encourage you every time I get a chance, get in the Word. Some of you are getting in the Word in the last few months. I know that because we've started this online thing, and I see you in there every day leaving comments or just clicking like, saying, hey, I'm here. I don't have anything to say today, but I'm here. Keep doing that because I know you're in the Word. And listen, this book will change you. Amen? It will. And when I know people are in the Word, there's all kinds of hope. So I'm, I'm going to keep encouraging you. Don't just get your fix on Sunday morning. Get in this Word on Monday, on Tuesday, on Wednesday, because God's talking on the other days too. And I'm always going to keep encouraging you to get involved in the life of the church. Don't just come and watch what's happening. We're glad that you're here, but there's a role for you to get involved and to serve and to use the gifts God's given you. Take the next step. Don't just limit Jesus to an hour out of your day on a Sunday morning for a little religion sprinkled on the top of your life. Wade out into the water and get involved in the work of the kingdom. Open your heart and invite the Holy Spirit to come in and lead and direct and to move around the furniture and do whatever he needs to do in your life. That's the only way to do this Jesus thing is to let him have control. Getting into the church is a great first step. Listen, I'm not trying to discourage that. So good to see a packed house this morning. So good to see people here today. Now that you're here, the chances are greater that you'll take this all-important next step that I came to talk to you about today. The next step is the one that I think Judas failed to make. The next step is, is not one that, that I as a preacher, it's not one that a church can get you to make. It's not one that if we just get you in the right ministry or program or Sunday school class that it can make you make. It is a, a step that you and the Holy Spirit of God together alone have to make. There is a moment that every believer has to say, am I just in this for the religion or am I in this for a relationship? That's the all-important next step. And it's a direct work of the Holy Spirit. Watch verse 65. Then he said, that's why I said that people can't come to me unless the Father gives them to me. Listen, there is something spiritual and supernatural that has to happen in the heart of a believer. I can't manufacture it. I can't preach a sermon that talks you into this next step. We can do all kinds of outreaches and things to help get you here and get you to this moment in your life. But this next step is a work of God in your heart. It saddens me to say this, but I'm just going to be real because of the law of probability. There are likely people in this room right now, today, January the, what is this, 22nd, who will not be here a year from now. And I don't necessarily mean you're going to die. I mean you won't be a part of this church. Something will change. Somebody's going to drift. Somebody is going to fade into the background despite our best efforts if this next step doesn't happen. And that's why I, I say some of you have a, a, a little religion, and we're glad because it usually starts with a little religion. You come around the religious folks. You do the religious things. But at some point, oh, I love to see when this happens, though, the light bulb goes on for somebody. And there will be a day when all of a sudden you realize, now I get it. Now I get why we come in and together and we sing these songs of praise. It's not just something we go through and we mouth it. I feel that in my very soul. Now I get it why we open the word because this is not just another book. This are the very, these are the very thoughts of God. And if I will apply this to my life, it will change me forever like it changed brother so-and-so and sister so-and-so over there. It's, this is real. This is not just Sunday morning playtime. And the light goes on, and we realize when I pray, that's not just a way to close the service. That's not just something I do before I eat my food. But there's power. I'm speaking to the creator of the universe, and things change when I pray. It, the light bulb goes on, and we realize we're not playing around with this thing. There is a real God who wants a relationship with me. That brings purpose to my life. What the woman at the well that we talked about last week, what she discovered when the light bulb went on for her, and she said, I'm not playing around anymore. This is the whole reason that I was created was to live for the glory of God. Listen, if you never get to that point, you may drift away. But once you let God get a hold of your heart, everything changes in your relationship with him. Apart from that relationship, you may not stand the test of time. Some of you have gone through the motions of religion. You've checked all the boxes that people point to to say, well, are you a Christian? You, you made a profession of faith. Check. You got baptized. 
Check. Those things are important. Don't get me wrong. Steps everybody should take. You're here. Check. Awesome. Is Jesus the Lord of your life? Is the Holy Spirit alive and moving the furniture around inside your heart? Is he the one that drives you every day when you get out of bed? Is he your first thought when you wake up and your last thought when you lay down in the bed at night? Faith that goes the distance puts Jesus in the center of everything. And Jesus saw people in that crowd that day that we're reading about today. They turned away and they left because they weren't ready to take that step. Verses 66 and 67 says, At this point, many of his disciples turned away and deserted him. And then Jesus turned to the 12 disciples and he asked, Are you going to leave too? Judas didn't stand the test of time. But the disciples who did stay, Peter, James, and John, and those others, they had a different spirit about them. And I want to look just in the time I have left at what did they get right. Verses 68 and 69, Simon Peter replied, Lord, to whom would we go? You have the words that give eternal life. He understood. We, we believe and we know that you are the Holy One of God. He had the right belief. They, they weren't going anywhere because they knew that something within this man that they encountered was real and it was life-changing. To whom would we go, they said. There's no other way of salvation. You're it. You're it. They believed and they knew nothing in life was more important. They weren't going anywhere. And I hope you've come to that place in your life. You see, I, what I'm saying today is that salvation, true salvation, not just religion, it's a work of the Holy Spirit. You got to let him work in your heart. You got to turn everything over. He's not a part-time God. He doesn't work as, as a consultant. He comes in and he becomes the Lord of your life. In, in, in Titus chapter, chapter 3, uh, verse 5, oh, I'm sorry, let me back up. When Jesus talked to Nicodemus, Nicodemus was a religious man. He had that stuff all figured out. But he came to Jesus, and Jesus said in John 3, verse 5, Jesus answered, Truly I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he can't enter the kingdom of God. You got all the outward religious stuff, but you need the Holy Spirit of God living in you. You need the transformation, Nicodemus, that truly is life. Because the Holy Spirit comes in, and what he does is he regenerates our heart. He comes in and he changes everything. Listen to Titus chapter 3, verse 5. If you don't listen to any other verse, listen to this one. He saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit. There, the religious part I can do, but the relationship part only the Spirit of God can do in our life. Do you know him? Do you know him on the inside? When the Holy Spirit regenerates your heart, listen, everything changes because all of the religious stuff turns into a relationship. When I realize that the creator of the entire universe wants to know me in the most intimate way possible, that he doesn't just hover over me or walk beside me, but he comes and he lives inside of me and he is my 24-7, 365 days a year God. Not just on Sunday morning, but he's in every priority I set every decision I make, every person I love, every truth that I try to build my life around, he's involved in everything. He's with me when I pray. He's with me when I hit my knees and I don't know where I'm going to turn. He is a 24-7 God that is walking in me and with me every day of my life. That is a relationship with God. In Ezekiel chapter 36, it says, and I will give you a new heart. This is written centuries before Jesus came. He's speaking of the Messiah. And he says, hey, I'll give you a new heart and a new spirit I'll put within you, and I will remove your heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. Listen, when the Holy Spirit truly lives inside of you, nobody's got to beg you to come to church. You want to be here. Nobody's got to beg you to open up the Word of God because the Spirit within you says, man, I got things I want to say to you. And I maybe couldn't have said this years ago, but I can honestly say it now. My favorite part, I have two favorite parts of getting up. One is getting coffee, if I'm really honest. I get up and I get coffee, but the second favorite part is to open up the Word and see what God has to say that day. Because I need to hear from Him before I hear from anybody. When somebody's heart has been regenerated, they have the Spirit of God living in them. They look at sin in a new way. Now listen, you'll still sin. You'll still struggle. You'll have some setbacks. You'll have to 
seek forgiveness and accept his grace and get back up. But you look at sin differently. You don't embrace it and run to it like you used to. You want it out of your life. God has, has shown you how it's destroying you. And the spirit within you now says that's not what we want anymore. And I want to obey him not as a rule keeper or some kind of legalist, but I want to obey him because I love him. And I realize what he's done for me and what, what he sacrificed for me on the cross. And I owe everything to him. And I want to honor him. I want to respect him and revere him with the way I live my life. They look at the church in a new way. They're not here out of guilt or obligation. They're here because they feel compelled to be here with God's people. Where else would you be? But with God's people, opening God's word, praising God together. They're not going to drift away. Or if they do, I believe they'll eventually come back. Now, can I just tell you and be real with you? I accepted Christ when I was 10 years old. I'm convinced I knew what I was doing. I was repentant. I was baptized. And I believe the Holy Spirit came and lived in my heart. But there was a period of time in my life, if I'm honest with you, when I grieved the Holy Spirit. And I'm not proud of it. But I turned from what I knew was right. And I did a lot of things I would be ashamed for you to know about me today. And But here's how I feel the Holy Spirit was with me even during that time. When I'd come home at the end of the day, I felt convicted. Have you ever been there? I knew it wasn't right. And for a while I wrestled and I kept going back and doing those same things. But I felt so convicted and guilty. I believe that's the Holy Spirit in my heart still working on me. And maybe that's where somebody is today. Maybe here in this room or watching online or listening on the radio. And you know this is you because you are in the same path. And that Holy Spirit, he's still in there fighting for you saying, come on back. Come on back. Let me have control again. I'll take you back to a place of stability. I'll take you back to the truth. I want to walk with you. I don't want to fight against you. I don't want you fighting against me. I want to live in harmony. Maybe that's where somebody is today. I want to ask the worship team if they'll come out. Now, let me be clear. They're going to sing a song, but this is not the invitation. I just want you to think and to pray and to meditate. Sing along if you want. Meditate on these words as they lead us in this next song. I'm going to come back. We're going to issue an invitation, a chance for you to respond to the Holy Spirit of God. But let's, let's let the worship team lead us in this next time.